I want to talk about leaving the bed. So leaving the bed is a classic instruction and is a core element of CBTI, but you should leave the bed when it's difficult to distract yourself visually. Using the degree of difficulty it is to distract yourself visually is kind of like your gauge about whether you should even be in bed in the first place. Hello, welcome to the Sleep to Healthy. I'm your instructor, Dennis Trumpy, and this is lesson number six of the Sleep to Healthy, How to Cure Your Insomnia class. This lesson is titled Sleep Buddy. In the last lesson, you learned about compact sleep, where we discovered how to spend more time in bed sleeping and less time being awake. This helped boost your sleep confidence and proved that your sleep system was not broken. Today's lesson will cover the second element of CBTI, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, Sleep Buddy. During your time with insomnia, you have trained yourself to associate your bed with being awake and building unpleasant emotions when you think of sleep. In this lesson, we are going to break those associations and implant a healthier, more effective connection between you, your bed, and sleep. You will learn when it's time to go to bed and what to do when sleep evades you. You will learn how to stop trying so hard and start letting sleep just happen. Back in lesson three on insomnia, we'd learned about negative associations and how they can be changed into positive associations. I gave you the example of someone you don't like and how by learning about their situation, your negative emotions associated with them could be dispelled. If you've been experiencing insomnia for a long time, you'll have built up negative associations with your bed and your sleep. How could you not? Sleep has let you down again and again. You get frustrated and angry not being able to sleep especially after you've tried so hard to sleep better. Your bed may be a place of dread for you, somewhere that you endure the night, unpleasant, uncomfortable, wasteful. Other than acknowledging this pain and discomfort, I'm not going to dwell much on this aspect of your sleep. It is helpful to acknowledge whatever negative emotions you have associated with sleep, I encourage you to take a pen and paper or word processor and write out how you feel about sleep and your bed. Be as vivid and livid as you can. Doing this will help you to let go of the negative associations you have pent up inside of you and will help you be successful with this aspect of CBTI. By expressing your emotions, your brain no longer has to draw them to your attention and it will be easier to move on. When you experience something negative in your life, you can become better or bitter. And I want you to become better. And writing out your negative emotions helps you become better. I will have an emotion venting form on my website, sleeptohealthy.com, that you can use if you decided to take advantage of this extra step, which is not formally part of the CBTI curriculum. Bed Buddy is about two things. It is about how you feel about and think about your bed and how you feel about and think about your sleep. Right now, I bet your relationship with your bed and your sleep is not very good. The types of words that you would use to describe your sleep in your bed are not the types of words that you would use to describe a good friend or a buddy. So let's just say that for now, you don't have a bed buddy, you have a bed antagonist. Your bed and your sleep seem to be antagonizing you rather than helping you feel and function as you want to be. What we want to do in this lesson is to turn your antagonist into your buddy, slowly but surely. Let's go back to our basics that we learned in lesson four about CBTI, which is beliefs lead to actions, lead to outcomes. Incorrect beliefs lead to wrong actions, 
lead to undesirable outcomes. Let's say that you get into bed and you just can't fall asleep. Your thought might be, if I'm not getting to sleep, I should lay here and make myself get to sleep. The action that follows is to stay in bed no matter what. The result is that you take the pleasant experience of falling asleep that good sleepers look forward to and enjoy and turn it into your antagonist, an event to fight with. You have changed your association with sleep from buddy to antagonist. Or how about when you wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep? You lay in your bed flipping and flopping, your mind racing and worrying, waiting impatiently for sleep to return. You invent things to do to get you to sleep, like counting sheep or counting backwards from 1,000 by threes. Your bed, that should be a place of comfort and relaxation, becomes a bed of thorns antagonizing you and stopping you from getting to sleep. You have turned your bed buddy into an antagonist. You don't think of your bed as a wonder place of refuge, but as a place of torment. I might be exaggerating, but I don't think by much. What happens over time is those associations become deeply ingrained, like a wagon traveling through a muddy road and leaving deep ruts. As the wagon has traveled the road many times, the ruts become so deep that the wagon couldn't go down a different route even if it wanted to. It couldn't get out of the ruts. You have developed a similar pattern in your brain. You have such deep, negative associations with your bed and your sleep that you cannot go to bed without having negative thoughts and feelings arise so quickly to the surface. Getting out of those ruts and getting onto the smooth path running beside your ruts is going to take some heavy lifting, but it's possible. When you want to make a new friend, you can't force it. You need to just let it happen naturally. In fact, you've probably tried to force someone to like you or had someone try to force you to like them. It just doesn't work, does it? Sleep is similar. You can't force it. But believe me, sleep wants to be your buddy if you would just back off and let sleep be itself and not what you're trying to force it to be. So let's start with bedtime. If you have someone you would like to be friends with, when would you approach them or try to get together with them? Would you pick a random time and force them to meet you at a time that is inconvenient to them? Or would you wait until they seem to be in the mood for getting together and socializing? When you climb into bed and you can't get to sleep, that is a sign that your sleep buddy is probably not ready to engage with you just now. In other words, your sleep drive is not strong enough. So back off and wait until they seem to be in the mood for sleep. The funny thing is, you know this, you have just forgotten. Have you ever experienced when a friend puts an object or event before your needs? Perhaps they're getting you some food, but what you really need is companionship. They haven't read your body language or haven't listened and understood what you said. In the same way, you're likely putting your digital clock ahead of your sleep buddy's needs to get into the mood for sleep. Stop looking at the stupid clock and start paying attention to your lifelong sleep buddy. I recommend covering all your clocks about an hour before your expected bedtime and listen to your body rather than clock watching. Otherwise, your sleep buddy is not going to be very cooperative because they don't like being forced to sleep. So, the first sleep buddy rule is don't go to sleep until you're sleepy. Once I say it that way, it sounds obvious, but most of us don't do this. I consider Michael Schwartz a sleep buddy genius, so we are going to hear a lot from Michael today. He refers to Sleep Buddy by its proper CBTI nomenclature, which is Sleep Restriction Therapy. Michael has a wonderful approach to your relationship with sleep, 
a great balance between being firm with the expectations while being gentle and non-technical on the implementation. So here is Michael Schwartz on going to bed only when sleepy. Go to bed only when you are truly sleepy. Sleepy is more than tired. Sleepy is more than exhausted. It's more than bored. Sleepy, I define it as struggling to stay awake. So that's what you want to feel before you decide to go to bed. How do you know you're struggling to stay awake? Um, if you're reading, you can't get through the paragraph. Maybe you've reread a sentence about five times. Maybe you're doing some crafty thing and you keep making mistakes. Maybe you're listening to a story and you keep kind of blanking out and wondering what they were just talking about. Um, that kind of th that kind of experience means you're struggling to stay awake. That's your cue. Put whatever you're doing away, turn off the lamp, and go to bed. By going to bed only when sleepy, you are reinforcing to yourself that your bed is where you sleep and where sleep comes easily. You are also disengaging your natural sleep rhythms from artificial rhythms dictated by technology and society. Your body and mind have a natural tempo of sleep and wakefulness. Trying to force yourself on this is like trying to dance the tango when your partner is trying to jive. It just doesn't work. Figure out what your sleep buddy's mood is and adapt to that. It reminds me of that saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. If your sleep buddy isn't happy, then you are not going to be happy. So find the dance that you both enjoy and then dance the night away. So, if you know that you shouldn't go to bed unless you are sleepy, then the corollary of this is also true. If you find yourself in bed and not sleepy, get the heck out of bed! In fact, don't stay in bed if you are not sleeping. And this is the second sleep buddy rule. If you are in bed and not sleepy, then get out of bed until you are sleepy and then try again. Some nights this will feel like a yo-yo, where you are constantly getting out of bed, returning to bed, realizing that you're not getting to sleep, getting out of bed again, and so on all through the night. The point is that you want to train your mind that bed is for sleeping and not for worrying, solving tomorrow's problems, or fretting about yesterday's experiences. It's just for sleeping. You want your mind to associate your bed with peaceful sleep, not restless tossing and turning. The rule normally given is to give yourself about 15 to 20 minutes to get to sleep. If this is not happening, then get out of bed. This creates a real paradox or a catch-22. If you can't sleep for 15 to 20 minutes, then get out of bed. Don't think about sleep or clock watching. So don't track the time or think about whether you are sleeping or not. Do you see the paradox? You really can't do both at the same time. Michael Schwartz has developed an ingenious way to resolve this issue, as he will explain. As your gauge for whether you should even be in bed in the first place. So basically if it's easy to distract yourself with imagery like you you are able to do that easily picture things and 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 really see them in detail then stay there stay in bed it means you're sleepy if it's difficult to do if you're not conjuring up images very easily you keep your mind just keep drift keeps drifting back to things that aren't your pleasant images then you're not sleepy enough for bed and that's really a much better strategy to use that introspection. Am I distracting myself easily or is it difficult as your gauge for whether you should be in bed in the first place? The bed, remember, is for being sleepy or being asleep. It's not for tossing and turning. It's not for being frustrated or anxious or anything like that. It's for being sleepy or being asleep. In my case, I have found two ideas that work well at getting my mind off of sleep and onto something else so I can drift off to sleep when I go to bed, either at the beginning of the night or after awakening in the middle of the night. 
The first is that I walk myself through a five-step thought process. I first try to recall memories from the day that make me smile. If I can't find any, then it prods me to make sure that I do something enjoyable the next day. Then I think of any good deeds I did, such as helping someone, even giving the dog a walk. Third, I think of things that I'm grateful for, even if my gratefulness is only for my next breath. Sometimes this list can go on and on for a long time. Next, I think of things that I'm looking forward to tomorrow and imagine how they might turn out and what I could do to make them unfold the way I hope. The fifth is I think of any obstacles I might experience tomorrow and what I might do to accept them if they are beyond my control or mitigate them if I do have some control. Usually, I am a sound asleep around step one or two. If I make it past step five, well, I should probably get out of bed and try again later. Another approach I use is to find all the words I can think of starting with a letter. This helps me to drift off to sleep. For instance, I try to think of all the words starting with the letter B, such as buddy, backhand, and bleak. It works for me because I find it fascinating to see all the different directions this exercise leads me, and I wonder why I thought of a particularly unusual word such as Budapest. I stop thinking about sleep, and before I know it, if I'm sleepy and not anxious, I fall asleep. I choose a different letter each night. An example of how my personal reaction to these ideas is the key, not the idea itself, I told my alphabet idea to a friend. They had a horrible time of it and found it made them frustrated, not relaxed. So no single idea will work for everybody or even most people. You just need to find what helps you get relaxed, feel engaged, and get your mind off of sleep. When deciding when to get out of bed, in addition to Michael's suggestion about seeing if my mind's eye engages easily, I just let my eyelids relax. If they pop open when relaxed, it's a pretty good sign that I should be getting out of bed. Remember the ruts we talked about earlier, how your chronic insomnia has created a deep path of behaviors and beliefs that make it difficult to do anything other than continue down your path of insomnia? Getting out of bed when you're not sleeping is the heavy lifting of moving your cart over to the smoother roadway. The cart will continue to drift back into the ruts, and your job is to keep lifting it out over and over again. You will feel like giving up. It will seem like it's making things worse, and for a while it likely will make things worse, and not just for one night. But eventually, you will be riding down the smooth roadway more frequently, and your sleep journey will become a pleasure not a burden. Here's a spoiler alert. Towards the end of this lesson, I will introduce you to a method that Michael Schwartz has developed that can speed the whole process up. But first, we have to finish up with our sleep buddy concept. Getting out of bed when you really want to get to sleep is hard to do. You always think that if you just give it a little more time, then sleep will come. But it can be a long wait, and there can be a lot of damage done to your relationship with your sleep buddy. Just as you would respect the boundaries of a good friend, you should respect how sleep is feeling and reacting to your advances to forcing sleep. I would like to give you a tip that can make getting out of bed easier. It is the five-second rule. The instant that you realize that you should get out of bed, start counting down from five, 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 five four, 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 three, three, three two, 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 one, one, one zero. 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 Before you reach zero, start the motions of getting out of bed. Start swinging your legs over to the side or start pulling the covers off or sit up in bed. Whatever you first do to get out of bed, start to do them you will find that the inertia of starting the motion will carry on, and before you know it, you will be up and out of bed and doing all the things that Michael's described earlier. 
I'll have a link to the five-second rule on my website, sleepthehealthy.com, if you want to learn more about this effective technique. The other issue getting out of bed raises is, what do you do when you get out of bed? What you do is almost as important as the act of getting out of bed in the first place. I'm going to let Mr. Schwartz explain his 12-step process. This audio is taken from Michael's podcast called Sleep on Q. That's with the letter Q. I will have a link to his podcast in the show notes. His podcast is especially helpful if you want to buckle down and really tackle your sleep buddy aspect of CBTI. I have a 12-step plan to get out of bed. And I'm going to go through the 12 steps. Okay, so the first thing you do... You realize you can't distract yourself. You're just, it's not happening. You can't visualize anything. You're worried about something or whatever. The first thing you do is you shrug. You literally shrug before you even put your foot on the floor. You just, you, you thumb your nose at the whole experience because you can't force sleep. You're not really in control. You can't force yourself to stay asleep. Can't force yourself to get back to sleep. You just shrug. And I think it's helpful whether you do it overtly or kind of in your mind, like a mental shrug. I think it helps start the whole thing off. Okay. So you put yourself on the right uh, mind frame. The second thing is something you should not do. You should not check the time. And you, as you probably know, I'm a big, big proponent of not knowing what time it is all night long. So make sure the clock is not available to you. It's not convenient. You're not going to look at it. So you don't want to know what time it is. You don't need to know. And I'm here to tell you that it probably just makes everything worse. So that's step two. Step three, leave the bedroom calmly. Don't beat yourself up. Stay positive. Some people get the attitude that if they leave the bed, they failed and they don't want to fail. So they want to just, they, they're convinced they can get back to sleep. So they stay in bed. And that's not a good thing to do. You want to calmly leave the bed. Tell yourself you're being proactive. You're reducing that classical conditioning, that Pavlovian conditioning that happens with being alert in bed for long stretches of time. You're taking charge. You're really being proactive. You know, pat yourself on the back and say, okay, let's do this. Let's get out of bed. Step four, keep yourself warm. A lot of the times in the year, the night is cold. That's the biggest reason that people don't leave the bed when they're awake at night is it's cold. The bed's comfortable and warm. Why would you leave? I kind of agree with that. I think it's hard to leave the bed when it's cold. You know, your bed is the most comfortable place in the house. You spend a lot of money to make it that way. Why leave? Well, it's back to the conditioning thing again. Your brain doesn't care. You're in bed, you're having trouble sleeping, you're tossing and turning. Your brain's going to condition that environment to be associated with being alert. So you got to leave the bed. How do you keep yourself warm? Simple things. A robe, slippers, hot tea. Make herbal tea and put it in a thermos and put it out by your book out in the living room. I think it's a great idea. Do that before you go to bed. Uh, Maybe a fireplace if it's easy to turn on and get some firelight going. That's a great kind of light at night. You want to just try to keep yourself warm. I had one client who had a great idea. She put her robe under her covers. And so when she woke up in the middle of the night, which she did pretty much every night, her robe was already warm. It was like right there next to her in bed. So she just like slipped it on, put some slippers on, went out, had some tea already made in a thermos. She was good to go. Okay, so enough about that. Keeping yourself warm, step four. Now on to step five. Go to your comfortable place and do a calm activity. That's as high tech as you need to get at night. Comfortable place, calm activity. Don't get too comfortable. Like don't lay down. You don't want to fall asleep out there. You just want to be pretty comfortable, but not where you could fall asleep easily. And do a calm activity. The reading, audiobooks, listen to music, crossword puzzles, coloring books, whatever it is, crafty things, whatever you like to do. You want to also, step six, be in a low incandescent light environment. So no weird lighting, no fluorescent LED halogen things. It should just be as simple as maybe a incandescent bulb in an old lamp right next to you. And that's about all you got to do. Just enough light to kind of see what you're doing and not strain your eyes. But incandescent, uh, that's firelight or heat generated light. So incandescent light bulb, some people like candles, some people turn their fireplace on and use the light from that. Whatever works for you. Step seven, no backlit screens, not even a peek, no check of the phone, no peek, no turning the TV on, even just to listen to it. it. No, no backlit screens should be around at night if you have left the bed because you're awake. It's the all the melatonin suppression and everything that goes along with it. Step eight, 
have a light snack if you're hungry. Don't torture yourself. Uh, don't eat something too sugary. That'll kind of stimulate your brain. And don't eat anything heavy that's hard to digest where you might feel uncomfortable when you go back to bed. Just a light little snack. Just, you know, maybe a little tryptophan, a little protein, a little glass of milk or something. Whatever works best for you. Uh, step nine. Go back to bed only when you are truly sleepy. Sleepy is more than tired. Sleepy is more than exhausted. It's more than bored. Sleepy, I define it as struggling to stay awake. So that's what you want to feel before you decide to go back to bed. How do you know you're struggling to stay awake? Um, if you're reading, you can't get through the paragraph. Maybe you've reread a sentence about five times. Maybe you're doing some crafty thing and you keep making mistakes. Maybe you're listening to a story and you keep kind of blanking out and wondering what they were just talking about. Th that kind of experience means you're struggling to stay awake. That's your cue. Put whatever you're doing away, turn off the lamp, and go back to bed. On your way back to bed, step 10 is a reminder of step two. Don't check the time. It's that important. Make sure it is not available to you. So on your way back to bed, you know, don't, oh, well, there's a clock on the wall near the bathroom and I always walk past it. And so I can't know. do something about it. Put a piece of tape over it. I don't know. Just do it something so you don't know what time it is at night. Back in bed, get settled in, be patient. Take your time, maybe do a few abdominal breaths, maybe stretch for a moment, you know, kind of get yourself all situated. And then when you're comfortable, go back to your imagery. Try to distract yourself with imagery again. Go to that part of the book you were reading, that movie scene that you love, the, the memory of some great experience you had in the past, whatever it is, go there visually, engage that mind's eye idea and really see something in your mind. Because remember, as I mentioned in the last episode, you can't focus on an image and sleep at the same time. So you don't wanna focus on sleep because focusing is trying and that doesn't work with sleep. So you gotta do something else. Focus on imagery. And the last step, step 12, repeat all these steps if distraction becomes difficult again. With CBT, it takes some effort, you know, it takes a little willpower and this whole leave the bed when you're alert and back to bed when you're sleepy again, it takes a little time for most people for it to really start to have an effect because if you remember classical conditioning, it took a while. The dogs didn't immediately stop drooling when they got the meat powder right away. It took a few times. So it's the same thing can happen with sleep. It can take a few times. So you got to just kind of hang in there. Sometimes you kind of feel like that human yo-yo thing where you're just in bed, out of bed. But be patient in general. Don't just jump out of bed the minute you think you're awake. And, you know, really kind of get into the imagery. Like, really, really try. Then when you're pretty convinced that it's just not happening, that's when you leave the bed. Okay, so that is what I suggest. Instead of, if you've been there for 20 minutes awake, get out of bed and do something boring. I think what I describe is a more helpful routine. A couple last little notes on that. Have your comfortable place out of your bedroom already set up before you go to bed. So have some options there. Maybe you're reading a book, but maybe you don't feel like reading. So have a couple other things to do there. Maybe a magazine and something to listen to or whatever. Kind of mix it up a little bit. So, you know, you, you keep interested in it. It's not like a super exciting thing, but it's, it's interesting enough where you don't mind doing it. And if you have a spouse or bed partner or anyone, let them know what's going on. So if you're out of bed in the middle of the night, they're not worried about you. They, they're, you're just doing your thing. You know, they don't, you don't need a big, huge conversation about what you're doing in the middle of the night. Remember that CBTI is designed to help people who have firmly entrenched chronic insomnia. At some point, you may no longer judge yourself as suffering from insomnia. Insomnia is not like the way Alcoholics Anonymous def defines alcoholism, that is, a disease that you carry for life. Insomnia is a temporary condition that you have developed from decisions, beliefs, and actions that interfered with you sleeping well. Once you have corrected these and you are sleeping well, given your life circumstances, then you do don't need to adhere so rigidly to the CBTI elements. As an example, like every other human on the planet, I still have wakeful nights. Sometimes I choose to get out of bed and follow Michael's advice, especially if I notice that I have fallen into a pattern of wakeful nights. But sometimes I am laying awake quite peacefully, but just not sleeping. I'm not feeling anxious and I don't have a monkey mind. 
In these situations, I may choose to stay in bed, think my peaceful thoughts, or perhaps meditate or play a mind game and let sleep naturally return. CBTI does not restrict you to a rigid sleep routine for life. Rather, it is liberating where you can choose when to sleep in or not, when to stay up late socializing or not, and so on. You will recognize when your lifestyle choices are leading you down the insomnia ruts, and you can easily move your cart over to the smooth roadway that you know is nearby. The third sleep buddy rule is to end your relationship with your sleep buddy at the same time every day. In other words, make your wake time consistent. So far, you may have the impression that your relationship with your sleep buddy is all one-sided. Your sleep buddy seems to make all the rules and get their own way. They decide when you initiate the relationship and what you can and can't do. That's not fair. Well, now it's time to assert your own boundaries. You get to decide when the sleep dance ends each morning. By getting up at the same time every day, regardless of how horrible or wonderful your sleep was, you are establishing a healthy sleep rhythm and letting your sleep buddy know that they can't push you around. You have your own boundaries in the relationship. In the case of sleep, absence indeed makes the heart grow fonder. You need to have a nice long separation from sleep for sleep to want to get together with you again the next night. As we learned in lesson one about the sleep drive, the sleep drive slowly builds up all day long while you're awake. If you sleep in, then there is less time for the sleep drive to build up and you will likely have more trouble getting to sleep the following night. If you sleep in, you have less time for your sleep drive to build. You will not be sleepy at bedtime and you won't have a deep sleep. Also, your awake time is the most important aspect of establishing the start of your circadian rhythm. If you don't make this consistent, say within half an hour a day today, perhaps within one hour on weekends, then it is likely giving your system jet lag. The signals get confused and your body and mind get out of sync and your sleep signals get confused. The cascade of events that allow you to go from wakefulness to sleep gets weak and uncoordinated and you don't get to sleep as easily. So set your alarm in the morning and stick to your awake time. You can use the five second rule that you use to get out of bed in the middle of the night to get out of bed in the morning. Also remind yourself that your priority is to sleep better tonight, not repair your broken sleep from last night. It's too late for that. You know repairing last night's sleep doesn't work, so don't even try. You will want to set your normal wake-up time to whatever time you normally have to get up in the morning. For most people, this is the time you get up for work. Again, Michael has some great advice on getting up in the morning. So what you want to do with your circadian rhythm is you want to anchor it. If you want to work on your sleep, the first behavioral thing you want to do is to anchor your circadian rhythm. And because you can't force sleep, all you can do is the other end of it, you can start each day at a consistent time. You can't control when you fall asleep, but you can absolutely control when you're done with sleep. Keeping that very consistent, no matter how well or how poorly you slept, is very important to stabilize your sleep. So starting your day, that's what I call it, to start your day, that's a purposeful thing. It's more than just waking up. It's you're up and you know, getting light, getting something to eat, taking a shower, having coffee, turning the TV on. These kinds of things are starting your day. Simply waking up isn't necessarily starting your day. So starting the day at a consistent time is usually the first major behavioral goal that I give someone who has come to me for guidance with their sleep. And it involves choosing a time that works for the client. So when I first meet the client, I like to ask them a lot of questions about, you know, what do they do and what's their experience during the day? What's their experience at night and all this. And one of the questions I ask is, what time do you get up for the day? What's your range? And I listen very closely to what they say. 
there's often kind of an obligatory time that's on the early side, and then there's the occasional sleep in. And a classic example is someone who works, say, nine to five, Monday through Friday, and then they sleep in on the weekends. So Monday through Friday, maybe they're up at seven in the morning. And then the weekends, they kind of hang out, lay around until nine or 10 or something like that. So there's this variance that's behavioral. Well, your brain doesn't really care if it's a work day or if it's a day off. It's just going to do what it does. So when I'm working with a client initially, I pay very close attention to what they say about the time they start each day. And I listen for that earlier obligatory time. Then what I usually suggest for them to choose a time to start each day is that obligatory time plus 30 minutes. I kind of hedge a little bit. I kind of feel like, you know, if you're working on your sleep, you want to be a bit flexible. In my experience, people tend to feel a little more at ease with this whole thing if you say, well, you know, if it's a really bad night, you want to just be in bed for a little extra time. I personally have not found that to be a problem for my clients. 30 minutes would be max. I would kind of encourage them to maybe say 15, like one snooze alarm and that's it. Um, or if they just want to stretch, kind of slowly work their way out of bed instead of just jumping out of bed. You know, what did Garfield the cat say? If humans were meant to pop out of bed every morning, then they'd all sleep in toasters or something like that. So I'm kind of like, you know, let's just like be a little reasonable about this whole thing. Now, other people might say differently. This is just my take on it. Do what's best, what seems to be most effective if you're working on your sleep. Also, anecdotally, I've noticed that when I'm working with clients, the ones that try to line up their morning rise time with the sunrise tend to improve their sleep a little faster than people who don't. So when people are kind of like, oh, I get up between, you know, 9, 10, 11, sometimes noon, and they say, okay, I can, I'll try for 9. If I can eventually work that back to like 8 or 7, closer to when the sun's rising, depending on the season, of course, they tend to start sleeping better. It's no surprise to me. The sunrise is very much a time cue. In German, they call that a Zeitgeber, a time giver. So the sunrise does that. It helps to really anchor your circadian rhythm. For most people, I do suggest using an alarm, some sort of reliable method for rising at the same time every morning. It does do things like it prevents clock watching, uh, which is not good for sleep. And so starting each and every day at a consistent time, getting good light exposure when you get up for the day, and trying to be a little bit active, in other words, just don't lay around, don't let yourself doze in and out, don't go back to bed. Try to be on your feet as much as you can, talk to your doctor about what you're capable of doing, and just trying to be active. It tends to be a great way to anchor that circadian, approximately a day rhythm. If a person is healthy and they have no mobility issues, a walk in the morning without their dark sunglasses on, I think is a fantastic way to really anchor that rhythm, which will in turn make falling asleep easier over time. In the winter, many of us wake up in the dark. It is a problem because one of the strongest triggers to kickstart our circadian rhythm is bright light. In addition, being woken up in the morning by an unpleasant sounding alarm clock is a jolt to the system and not a natural way to wake up. Ideally, you would be gently woken at a time when you're sleeping lightly or experiencing an awakening as discussed in previous lessons. There is a way to do this. It is called a light alarm clock. This is an alarm clock that turns on a light rather than sounding an irritating alarm. I've put a link to the light alarm clock that I use in my sleepthehealthy.com website, along with some tips that I use to make it most effective. The alarm also has an audible alarm, so if you don't wake up to the light, you still won't sleep in. I don't want to go into the details here, so I will have some tips on how to use this device successfully on my website. The other alternative is to get a smart light bulb that you can program to come on around your wake time. Waking up to light rather than an alarm is not essential for CBTI, but it has been a game changer for myself and other members of my family. A personality trait of your sleep buddy that you should be aware of is that they are jealous. Your sleep buddy does not like sharing your sleeping space with others. Your buddy does not like it when you bring work into their space. 
They don't like it when you have intense discussions right when you're going to have an intimate time with your sleep buddy. So don't do anything in your sleep space that would be offensive to your sleep buddy. Nothing stressful or distracting. Don't call it your bedroom. Call it your sleep room. You don't call your living room your couch room, do you? The one exception to this is that your sleep buddy wants you to have great relationships with others that you care about. So the bedroom can be shared with your partner and sex is okay. Just not other stressful or disturbing activities and relationships. Just sleep and sex in the sleep room. To help you, I have made a list of rules of do's and don'ts for creating a great relationship with your sleep buddy on my website, sleepthehealthy.com. Good luck at turning your sleep antagonist into your sleep buddy. You may have been wondering what the tip is for shortening this whole painful process from Michael Schwartz. I have emphasized over and over again that you can't force sleep. You can't make sleep happen when you want. What if there was an exception to this rule? Well, there is. It's called sleep on cue, this time spelt C-U-E. When you want to learn a skill such as shooting a basketball, you can grab a basketball and practice as much as you want until you learn the skill. With sleep, You may have lost the skill to fall asleep quickly and effortlessly, but you only get one chance a night. And even then, that practice session may not go so well. Sleep on cue is an amazing method that lets you practice getting to sleep many times in a short space of time. Since this method may not interest all listeners and isn't part of the CBTI curriculum, I'm going to let Michael explain it at the end of this So, if you're interested, Michael will explain everything in about two minutes. I will also have links and an explanation on my website, sleepthehealthy.com. In scientific terms, sleep on cue is called intensive sleep retraining, a term that might have you running for the hills if it wasn't going to potentially save you a lot of grief. So, that's it for sleep, buddy. I want to remind you that if you want to do some of your own research on this CBTI or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia element, in CBTI terminology, Sleep Buddy is called Stimulus Control Therapy. Next lesson, we will be covering sleep myths, unlearning everything you thought you knew about sleep. This is the third of the five CBTI elements. The first two elements have focused on behavior changes physical actions you can take to improve your sleep. But sleep is a function of the brain and the mind, so the next three lessons will focus on changing how you think about sleep. Do you think that you could force yourself to sleep if you just tried hard enough? Wrong. Did you think that sleeping pills create sleep? Wrong. Did you think that if you had the right combinations of things to do and products to take at the right time, that it would make you sleep? Wrong. We are going to look at these myths and many more to tell you what works and what doesn't and why. You will never be misled by false advertising or unrealistic claims again. In those that develop chronic insomnia, what happens is they start to worry. They start noticing this is a problem. There's a red flag. Something is wrong. I can't sleep. Now I've got to do something about it. And they try to sleep. They start by going to bed earlier. That doesn't work. They try to take some melatonin. That doesn't work. They buy a sleep mask. That doesn't work. And the fear, the anxiety, the, the problem grows. And it's, it's really difficult to see this from the inside. But really what is happening is... The pursuit of trying to solve the problem has become the problem. This lesson, like other lessons, comes with an assignment. You can find the assignments at sleepthehealthy.com. I'm sure you can guess what today's assignment is. Your assignment, should you decide to accept it, 
is to create a great relationship with your sleep buddy by following the advice in this lesson. All the instructions are at my sleeptohealthy.com website. Go there and work the plan. It's as simple as that. Well, that's it for lesson six. It would be great to hear from you and how this course is helping or frustrating you, or if you have any questions. Just use any of the easy-to-use contact methods at sleepthehealthy.com. As mentioned throughout this course, executing CBTI is hard. In fact, the majority of people will either not be able to implement CBTI well by themselves, or it will take them much longer, perhaps months rather than weeks, to get it working the way it should. The reason is that it's as much psychological as it is practical. Life is complex and situations vary drastically. My job is to give training in CBTI and give you the tools and advice I know of to allow you to be successful at CBTI, ideally on your own. But a podcast cannot be responsive to your individual needs. If you are one of the lucky few who can do it by yourself quickly, then congratulations. If you are in the majority, then you may appreciate some help along the way. I would like to leave this message from Michael Schwartz. I am more than willing to help anyone who contacts me to do a session of sleep coaching. More than happy to. It's uh, something I just simply like to throw out there and offer to anyone. I have on my website, which is Sleep on Q, and actually you can do it Sleep on Q as in Sleep on and then C U E dot com or sleep on the letter q.com. Either one will take you to the website. And there I have a page for sleep coaching. And if you see the page, you'll see that it shows that I don't charge anything, but I offer kind of a virtual tip jar. And I do that do this as a kind of a pay it forward idea. So a lot of people struggling with insomnia, you know, they might not have financial means to go see a professional in a in a medical office in this kind of setup. So I offer my services, which I'm not a doctor, and I make that very clear with every client that I work with, but I can offer suggestions for behavioral change to help with sleep. And I'm happy to do a session with anyone who contacts me, and my contact is right there on the website. And then if anyone does feel so moved after I've worked with them, if they feel like they've made some improvements, if they would like to uh, contribute to uh, my PayPal link, it's right there. And it simply helps keep the website up and helps uh, cover a little bit of my time for anyone else who might need some sleep coaching that maybe isn't uh, financially able to do that. And then on my website, I also have a link for my smartphone app, which is the Sleep on Q, Sleep on C-U-E, Q. It's uh, it's a sleep training app that anyone can use if they're having uh, trouble falling asleep or getting back to sleep. It kind of guides them through a procedure called intensive sleep retraining. And there's links to the, the research about that. So I like to offer that app on my website as well. And here is the disclaimer spoken in one breath. I hope it's obvious, but this podcast is not a substitute for advice from a qualified healthcare professional. The sole purpose of this podcast is to educate and entertain. As we do not know your particulars, we cannot possibly provide professional or medical advice. Your use of the information in this podcast is at your own risk. If someone relies on a hypnotic medication, a sleeping pill of some sort to initiate sleep, this app can be a great way to start to help taper off that medication if that's what the person and their doctor have decided is best. Here's the information about Sleep on Cue that I promised earlier. I want to say two things to introduce this to you. First is that I've used this method personally, and it did everything it claimed to do. I have put my Sleep on Q graph and a few comments about my experience on the website. Secondly is that this is an astonishing use of a cell phone to replace a complex, expensive, inconvenient experience with a simple, convenient, economical alternative. The Sleep on Q app that Michael developed would cost you 
thousands of dollars to do in a sleep lab if you could ever find a sleep lab that was willing to do it for you. For me, Michael has created a smartphone miracle for sleep. Here is Michael to explain it all to you. So intensive sleep retraining is a technique that was developed by some Australian researchers uh, roughly 10 years ago is when they first published something on that. And intensive sleep retraining involves repeated short opportunities to fall asleep. And the, the idea of why this might help is in traditional stimulus control, at the start of the night, if you have trouble falling asleep, the instruction would be to get out of bed if sleep is not easy. And then go back to bed when you feel like you're truly sleepy again. And then even later, if sleep is still difficult and elusive, to get out of bed again. And then once again, go back to, to bed when you feel sleepy again. It's an effective strategy. It can be a bit um, unstructured, I guess is the best word. So these Australian researchers said, what if we structure this? What if we formalize this? This whole idea of give yourself a short period of time to see if sleep happens, and then if it doesn't, we'll instruct you to get out of bed, and then shortly after that, lay back down. This whole idea, it kind of makes sense from a conditioning standpoint. It is also preceded by intentional sleep deprivation. So in other words, when they studied this in a laboratory where they attached EEG wires on the top of the subject's heads, the subjects came into the lab around bedtime to initiate this process. Now, before they came to the lab, they were sleep deprived at home by an instruction of no more than, I think it was five hours in bed the night before. And so they showed up at the lab around bedtime pretty naturally sleepy. That homeostatic sleep drive was fairly strong. And then they instructed them to lay down. The recording was started. They gave the person uh, about 20 minutes to fall asleep. And the instruction was simply, just try to fall asleep. And then what happened after 20 minutes was if the person had not fallen asleep, the technician went in because they knew that they were asleep or not asleep based on the recording that they were viewing. And they tapped the person on the shoulder and said, do you think you just fell asleep? And the person said either, yeah, I think I did, or no, I don't think I did. And then the technician, who knew the correct answer because they had the recording, they said, you're correct, that you did fall asleep, or you're incorrect, you didn't fall asleep, or whatever combination it was. They were giving, given immediate feedback. Now, if the person fell asleep before 20 minutes, the technician allowed them to sleep for a couple of minutes, I believe. I think it might have been three minutes in the original research then went in the room. So this could have happened before the 20 minute mark, but they did the same thing. They tapped the person on the shoulder, knowing that they were probably asleep at that moment. The person woke up, the technician said, do you think you just fell asleep? The person said yes or no. Technician gave them the correct answer. And then the instruction after that was to get out of bed for a couple minutes. So regardless, at the end of the, back, the, of the feedback questions, the person was instructed to get out of bed for a few minutes. And then on the next half hour, lay back down and repeat the whole process. Given a 20 minute opportunity to fall asleep, given feedback about whether or not they think they fell asleep, and then instructed to get out of bed again until the next half hour. That was repeated for about 50 times, which took them around the clock from bedtime to about bedtime the next evening. That is, in a nutshell, what intensive sleep retraining is. The app I developed essentially out of a call to action. So in the 2012 uh, seminal study on intensive sleep retraining, where they concluded that this type of in-lab training for about 24, 25 hours on the half hour, it produced pretty strong resolution of a chronic insomnia condition. And it was looked at compared to a group of subjects that only did traditional stimulus control instructions for about four weeks. So they compared this 24-hour technique, simply one 24-hour period, to the effects of a traditional four-week stimulus control program. And they found that they were equivalent, that they were essentially the same effect. The kind of a light bulb went on and they said, well, that's, that's amazing because that's only 24 hours. They also looked at these people, these subjects, 
down the road, up to six months afterward, and they found that the improvements held. And that answered the question, which is a logical question of, well, does intensive sleep retraining only drive up your homeostatic sleepiness because you've been awake for quite a bit of time for the last, say, you know, 30 hours or so? Because if you notice in the sleep, intensive sleep retraining protocol, not much actual sleep is accomplished. If the person falls asleep within the 20 minutes of the sleep trial, the person is woken up after, I think it's three minutes of sleep. So they never accumulate very much sleep. And if you understand a bit of sleep physiology, you don't get into a very deep sleep after three minutes of time. You're still kind of in a stage one, two transition period. It's a lot of sleep deprivation built in. Back to this finding that the effects, the positive effects of the training held as long as the stimulus control effects the answer was that it was learning. The subjects learned to some degree in some fashion, they learned what feeling sleepy and falling asleep felt like. The effects were not due simply to sleep deprivation. Okay, so back to your original question. Sorry for that side track there, but your, your question of, yes, I developed the Sleep on Q app based on a call to action. At the end of that 2012 study, two sleep researchers who are very well known in the field, one has since passed away, Dr. Spielman and Glowinski, they published a review and it was commenting on this remarkable finding and how effective it was and it was behavioral. They concluded their review with a paragraph that I've essentially almost memorized at this point because it really, really resonated with me. They talked about how a technique to do intensive sleep retraining in a non-laboratory setting, i.e. at home, needed to be created. And I remember at the time, this was in 2013, I think it was, I was staring at this paragraph saying, yes, like this should really be developed. And that led me to my journey of developing what is now the Sleep on Q app for smartphone. And I, just a little in case anyone's curious, I started off trying to develop an actual device, a handheld device that had an accelerometer in it and a battery and you held it in your hand and you dropped it when you fell asleep. And kind of, I went down all these paths and the smartphone was just a natural fit for it because I needed an accelerometer and that was an easy way to accomplish that. So the way that it works is you around bedtime, ideally after a poor night of sleep. So you're kind of naturally tired. And I'm doing all this, I should preface with, I tried to follow the original ISR protocol. In other words, they brought subjects in who were a bit sleep deprived, but I didn't want to tell someone to sleep deprive themselves. Um, a legal person I talked to didn't think that was a good idea, and I tend to agree with them. But I phrase it as if you've had a poor night on your own. Most of the people who buy the app say that's not a problem because most of their nights are not particularly great. So they're always a bit sleep deprived. So around bedtime, you start the app, you lay down in bed, and you hold the app in your hand, and you just get comfortable. And then you try to let yourself drift off. After a period of time, the phone will vibrate. And the vibration is to alert the user that they need to now answer the question, do you think you fell asleep? So maybe the person was asleep, maybe they weren't. The vibration alerts them. Sometimes it wakes the person up, i.e. if they were just asleep. And as I mentioned before, because a person can't get into a deep sleep in just a couple of minutes, it's never a problem. The, the vibrations seem to always alert or wake the person up. They look at the phone. The phone simply asks the question, as you know, do you think you fell asleep? Answer yes or no. You tap on your choice, and then you're immediately told what the correct answer was. You're told if your perception or your awareness of falling asleep or not falling asleep was correct. Then the app asks if you want to do this again. Do you want to do another sleep trial? So you hit yes, and it says, okay, get out of bed for a couple of minutes. And I have, a, I have a countdown timer. I think it's a three minute timer. So it kind of instructs you to leave the bed. At least, if nothing else, just get up and stretch for a minute. And then when it vibrates, you go back to bed and you tap it and you say, start another sleep trial. And you, that's what you do. Now, I left out the biggest part of this whole app, which is the sleep trial itself. How does it know if you are falling asleep? 
Well, it uses a call and response method. So because it's not recording EEG or brain waves, it's actually sending you a faint audible tone periodically. And the instruction is when you hear the tone to give the phone a little shake, a little jiggle, and it activates the accelerometer in the phone. So it knows the phone just moved. That tells the app that the person is still awake because if you hear a tone, you can't shake the phone slightly if you're asleep. You wouldn't perceive the tone. And I set up this call and response as a method for determining sleep versus no sleep based on some old research that I found from the 60s originally where they were looking at audible tones and perception. And they found, I found one great study that, was, that showed that your auditory threshold, in other words, your reaction to noise, go, your threshold goes way up when you reach what we call stage two sleep, which is the most common form of sleep that we have. It tends to start a few minutes after you fall asleep. And so my goal with this app was to try to catch the user right at the start of stage two sleep so that they would kind of have more of a subjective feeling that they actually were asleep. Because what we know with regular stage one sleep, your initial phase that you go into after being awake, if you wake someone up out of stage one sleep, very often they tell you they didn't think they were asleep. You feel like, no, I wasn't asleep. And then you have brain waves to show that they actually were asleep, but it was that light transitional stage one. I wanted the app to be programmed in a way which I did, a way to detect as close as possible the onset of stage two stable sleep, which would give the person a more reliable indicator of sleep. This app is a sleep trainer, not a sleep tracker. A sleep tracker might be something like an app on the phone where you put the phone under your mattress or pillow, or maybe you have a device on your wrist, which is sending motion information to your phone next to you to give you an idea of sleep and wake or sleep stages, how, de how deep your sleep is, things like that. Trackers are different than this app. This app is a trainer. It is designed to reverse the classical conditioning that we talked about earlier, that Pavlovian conditioning. So it's not a tracker, it's a trainer. I want to also point out in the app, it gives you an unlimited number of sleep trials, that whole experience that I described from kind of step one to the, to the finish of each trial where you lay down, the phone starts sending you faint audible tones, you shake the phone and then it alerts you that the trial is over, you give your estimation of sleep or wake, yes or no, and it tells you the correct answer. Then it says, get out of bed for a couple minutes and come back and do it again. That whole thing is what we call a sleep trial. You can do as many sleep trials as you want. In the original research, they did 20, 25 hours of sleep trials on the half hour. I program the app in a way that you can do more sleep trials per unit of time than you can following the traditional ISR protocol. So then the question becomes, well, how many sleep trials should a person do? I tend to leave that mostly up to the individual. I have had users who have contacted me after doing a full 24 hour routine with this, with the app. And they may have done instead of the 50 trials, because if you do the math on the half hour for 25 hours, you get 50 sleep trials in the research. My app, I think the person may have done like 130 sleep trials or something like that because it varies the time between the trials. There's a lot of programming involved in the app that allows you to do more sleep trials per unit of time. So I tend to recommend at least about 12 to 15 sleep trials to anyone who wants to start off using the app. I think that provides a reasonable experience and probably some initial training to improve their insomnia by doing 12 or 15 sleep trials, again, around bedtime and again, after a somewhat poor night of sleep, so you're naturally a little sleepier. After you're done doing sleep trials, you should then just put the phone down and go to sleep. So it's, it's not meant to track you all night long. It's meant to train. The number of trials is up to the user, but then when they're done, and I often encourage people to use, quote unquote, they're done, to mean they really don't want to do this anymore. 
they're kind of done with it. They're, they're sort of, they're just not mentally there anymore. And what that often means is that they're really sleepy and they're really, they're really tired, really sleepy, and they don't want to do this anymore. That's actually fantastic. My instruction then is just put your phone down. Don't even fiddle with it. Don't worry about turning the app off or anything. Just put the phone down and curl up and see what happens because you can't force sleep. The graph, it is um, portable in a sense. You can email graphs and save them to your photos and this kind of thing. So um, I'm always open to any user who has my app. If they want to email me a graph for my comments on it, I'm always happy to do that graph, which really are two things. It shows whether falling asleep is getting easier and it shows whether your awareness or your perception of whether you fell asleep each trial is getting better. And often, and the research would, would con confirm this, it's the awareness component. Are you getting better at determining whether you fell asleep or not that leads to the improvement in ability to fall asleep? So on the graph, there are, two, there, there are two dimensions to it. It's a bar graph. So the height of the bars represents the trial time, which is variable. In other words, if the bars are going down, they're getting smaller, you're getting better at falling asleep. And the other aspect of the graph is the color of the bars. They're either red or blue. If it's a red bar, it means that your perception, that particular sleep trial, was correct excuse me, it was incorrect. Red would be an incorrect perception. A blue bar would be a correct perception of whether you fell asleep or not. So those are the two dimensions. The height of the bars is sort of your ability to fall asleep and the color of the bars represents your awareness of whether you fell asleep or not. They're inherent in a smartphone app is engagement with your phone. Clearly, people, most people with insomnia, they've read it, they've been told, they know. You shouldn't really be engaged with your phone at night. So I had immediately, right off the bat, kind of this paradox, this instruction of use your phone to train yourself to, to sleep better, but then the other side is a general instruction of don't use your smartphone in bed. I kind of had to to do some programming to try to reduce and minimize the deleterious effects of the screen from your phone. So the phone is emitting a frequency of light. I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but it's emitting a, screen, a, a type of light that's only seen during the daytime. And so your brain, if it, it will perceive that, and it can affect your natural melatonin production. A lot of people now try to filter this blue light out at night, maybe from their TV or their phone by maybe wearing glasses, orangey rose, uh, orange colored uh, glasses, or simply turning off their TV earlier, which is really a good recommendation. So my, my challenge was how do I get people to see that a little bit of phone engagement with my app might lead to real big improvement in a condition of chronic insomnia. And so I programmed it. If you see the app, you'll notice the screens have a lot of kind of orangey brown colors and fonts and uh, colors of fonts and things like that because I was trying to eliminate that type of light as much as possible. If someone relies on a hypnotic medication, a sleeping pill of some sort to initiate sleep, this app can be a great way to start to help taper off that medication if that's what the person and their doctor have decided is best. It's also the app can be a great method for doing something productive for your sleep if you're doing CBTI. One of the instructions in CBTI is to have kind of a later target bedtime. In other words, it kind of, it's trying to get you to stay up later before you even go to bed in the first place. They don't really say, the people who do CBTI, most of them don't give a lot of specific guidelines on what to do during that time. And some people actually, they find that they start to nod off when they're on the couch waiting for their target bedtime. What I suggest is if you have a target bedtime because you're doing CBTI, let's just say it's midnight. Let's say you normally have been going to bed at nine or 10 and the person who's doing your CBTI has said, let I've I've looked at your behavior. Let's have you climb into bed at midnight from, you know, for the next week or two. Maybe after a couple nights, 
staying awake until midnight gets more challenging and you find yourself sort of pacing the halls, maybe even getting a little frustrated, kind of falling asleep in front of the TV on the couch, although you're not trying to, you just kind of start to doze off. Well, doing this sleep training, I think, is a great idea. I like to think of this app really as kind of like stimulus control on steroids. It's very structured and intensive. That's the, the first word in an ISR is intensive, and that's really what we're talking about. It gives the person doing CBTI a productive thing to do for their sleep while they're waiting for their target bedtime. So maybe if sleepiness, you start to feel sleepy around 10 or 10.30, you could do 12 or 15 sleep trials while you're waiting for your target bedtime. Because even if you fall asleep in your sleep trials, it's going to wake you up after just a couple minutes. You're not going to accumulate enough sleep to affect the night of sleep that's ahead. I have been trying to get that message out that this is a way to enhance CBTI. It is not meant to replace CBTI. CBTI, of course, includes other instructions that this app has nothing to do with, like learning basic relaxation or figuring out when you should be in bed. What is your sleep window? They like to call that. Um, it has nothing to do with, with sleep hygiene. It doesn't instruct you any, give any instructions about caffeine use or alcohol or exercise or anything like that. It doesn't do anything cognitive restructuring wise. It doesn't, doesn't address negative attitude and irrational beliefs about sleep and things like that. It's just pure basic training. It is really kind of insomnia 101. And I do think that is the best use for the app is someone who has started doing CBTI and is hoping for a quicker, more uh, robust initial response to it. It did take a fair amount of financial resource and time often late at night time, to have this app programmed just right because I really, really knew what I wanted to do. As I really got into this project, my thoughts were really crystal clear. I knew exactly the timing of things that I wanted to do in the app, of programming, the sensitivities of the accelerometers. I really, really got very clear about that. And so I was pretty meticulous. And I'm not the most meticulous guy in general. I tend to be a little more just kind of colloquial and kind of easygoing and all that. But with this app, I really got very specific with it. And so that took a while, um, maybe some behavioral change on my part to, <laughs> to be that way. But I, I do want to say that um, it, it is, it, it's a one-time cost. So if you buy the app, any future updates are automatic. There's nothing else to buy in the app. There are no advertisements that pop up. It doesn't do anything with your information. It's not linked to Facebook or anything. It is a standalone app. When it's on your phone, everything works. You could be in the middle of nowhere with no connection to anything, and that app will work exactly the way it does in your own home. I do think a couple little uh, other things I would just want to point out. One is some people find it beneficial to use like an earbud headphone when they're using it, when they're doing their sleep trials. Not everyone. I, I kind of like that, and I just like to share that. Since you're not going to be lying down for hours, you're just there for you know a few minutes perhaps, you're not going to get all twisted up in a wire with a headphone. And the tone itself, the, it, it's very important to use your volume setting on your phone on the side of the phone to just make it as faint as possible. That's really the one kind of innate part of a call and response is – it has to give you a stimulus. The tone has to be audible enough to hear, but it needs to, to be kept as faint as possible. And it sounds like a distant foghorn, I think is the best description I've ever gotten for that tone. And then the last thing I want to point out that uh, along what you were saying is the app does also have another function, and that is to do structured naps. And I don't know if you were wanting to talk about that, but that is another feature besides sleep training. It can help guide you through uh, a nap using the same call and response uh, programming. You just need to know proven instructions on what you can do today to sleep better tonight so you can feel and function better tomorrow. And that's about it. Thanks for joining me in my sleep class. I look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the Sleep to Healthy podcast. See you then.